the Connected Places Catapult have been supporting Network Rail uh, to bring innovation to their business uh, before passing over to Network Rail themselves to give some background to their safety task force and a recap of what the current request is looking for. Uh, before we do that, I'll give a quick overview of the purpose of today's session and how it's going to be structured. So just to be clear on the aim of today's session, uh, this is, as it's stated on the screen there, um, the aim is to enable you to clarify your understanding of the challenge to be solved, uh, such that you can submit hopefully your best response to the prior information notice, which is currently live. Uh, the pin itself is open now and will be open until noon on the 21st of April. So in this session, we'll give you a quick overview of who the connected places catapult are, what we do, how and why we publish this pin. Uh, we'll then do a quick recap of the, the sorry, we'll do, then do an introduction to the safety task force at Network Rail, uh, which gives some background and context to this uh, challenge request. Uh, and then we'll do a quick recap of the challenge statement itself. The main part of the session, the main focus today though, um, is to be an open Q&A session uh, where together with network rail experts on this call we will aim to clarify any questions which you have in relation to submitting a response to the pin uh, these questions could be technical they could be related to the process or any other query you may have about the pin uh, we've scheduled an hour and a half for this session which should give sufficient time to address all the questions uh, after which we will draw to a close uh, for the questions themselves you can um, at any point during the session you can submit your questions into the q a panel which on your Zoom panel should be um, sort of towards the bottom of the screen. Um, and when we get to the relevant section of the session, we will go through the questions that have been submitted to that chat box um, in order. Uh, just in case we're unable to get through all the questions within the hour and a half, we'll, we'll have a log of the questions submitted so we can always follow them up offline or else you can uh, submit questions through the practice link of the PIN itself. So, just a very quick um, overview of who the catapults are. So the catapults, for those who aren't aware, are neutral not-for-profit organisations created by and partly supported by Innovate UK, uh, with, a, with a primary aim to foster innovation and promote productivity and economic growth in the UK. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute how we do that. So there are currently nine catapult companies uh, which form a network of world-leading technology centres, um, each all organised around specific areas of UK strength. So for example, high value manufacturing, digital catapult, offshore renewable, and of course, Connected Places Catapult. Uh, the Connected Places Catapult itself was formed in 2019 by the emerging of two former catapults, which were the Transport Systems Catapult and the Future Cities Catapult. Uh, so with that background, particularly in transport systems, uh, obviously we have a lot of relevance to the sort of activities that Network Rail are involved in. Um, so the catapults themselves, so all the catapults have um, both staff with a sort of deep technical and, in, and industry experience in fields relevant to their remit. Uh, and we use these to scope, support or lead as necessary technical projects relevant to the overall goals of each catapult. Um, at Connected Places Catapult, we have a number of industry um, innovation partnerships where we aim to work closely with that industrial partner to help support innovation within their organisations. Uh, and of particular relevance to this domain are partnerships we have with, for example, Network Rail and HS2. Uh, we also have close collaboration with a number of UK academic institutes where we aim to help drive um, the links between academia and industry and help promote innovation within the UK. Uh, and finally, we have a strong focus on supporting SME organisations in particular who may have innovative ideas, products or capabilities but for various reasons may struggle to push those through to the market. Um, and I suppose broadly, the way we do that is capturing these sort of three um, sections. So we connect, we spark, and we accelerate. So connect the market by um, facilitating engagement, showcasing business and research capabilities. Um, we aim to spark new possibilities by generating, for example, market intelligence, convening research institutions, and we aim to accelerate commercialization of innovative products by, um, for example, initiating opportunities for innovators to participate in projects, uh, maybe supporting some test beds, um, or championing the use and creation of standards as some examples. 
So that's a very quick run through summary of the catapult itself. Um, speaking now specifically about the program um, in which this program originates, we have a, a program where we support Network Rail in identifying innovation which may help to address some of the challenges that Network Rail are facing or the objectives they have. Uh, and this program is called the Innovation Factory. So broadly speaking, within this program, um, once a challenge or a business need is identified, there may be a number of different ways in which we as an organisation might work together with Network Rail. Um, it could be that we engage with industry and academia through our networks um, to find or invite solutions to the challenges identified, this PIN being one example of that. Um, we can help foster creativity to find new ideas or solutions, hackathons for example, um, we provide neutral view on potential new technologies, or we could support um, in accelerating the development idea or technology by, for example, technical support to an SME through supporting demonstrator projects or assisting with different technology procurement routes. Um, so we've, for Network Rail, we've run a number of these um, sort of horizon scanning and um, market engagement activities where we're ultimately looking to identify innovative or new solutions to, to the challenges that Network Rail have. So in these sorts of projects, typically we, we would work with Network Rail to understand the nature of the challenge they have, um, to capture the essential attributes that any solution would need to encapsulate, uh, and ultimately turn that, into, that understanding into the challenge statement, which by now you, you will have all seen. Uh, and the, the main aim of the challenge statement is not to define exact requirements for what the solution should look like, but to capture what it needs to be able to do. Uh, and in this way, the intention is not to, to prejudice or exclude any potential solution from being proposed, but to cast the net as wide as possible and hopefully unearth new and potentially innovative solutions to the, the identified problem. Uh, once this challenge is defined and published, it's pushed out to industry as we've done with this pin. Uh, and obviously, as I say, we, we invite organisations such as yourselves to offer potential approaches which you believe will deliver a solution to the challenge. Um, in parallel, we sometimes um, conduct our own horizon scanning activities to identify or unearth solutions elsewhere in sort of parallel markets or parallel industries. Uh, and at the culmination of these activities, uh, we review and assess the proposed solutions either through the PIN process or, a, or our own research uh, and present the potential technology landscape to Network Rail with recommendations uh, for which solutions we believe have the potential to address the challenge and which therefore we recommend Network Rail to investigate in more detail. So that's say a quick overview of the catapults and a quick background to how we are supporting Network Rail in these um, activities. Uh, so coming to today's event specifically, so as I said at the start, the purpose of this webinar is to offer you the opportunity to reinforce your understanding of the challenge, the need, uh, and to clarify any questions you might have around either the process for submitting an idea or requesting more specific um, requirement questions which you might have. Uh, the aim of today's session is to be a fully two-way engagement event, so please feel free to ask as many questions as you need into the Q&A panel, which we will come to later in the session. Um, so yes, let's say, please do submit all your questions into that Q&A panel and we will come to those in due course. Okay, that is it from me for now. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Ray Clark from Network Rail, who is the Programme Manager in Track Worker Safety, um, who will give a bit of um, background context to the Safety Task Force at Network Rail, which has um, led to the, the PIN request, which is currently live. So I'll now <coughs> hand over to Ray. Stuart, can you stop sharing, please? And then I can share mine. Hopefully everyone can see that. Nod will do. Here's seeing the 
All right. Okay. How's that? Yeah, seventeen D. Good, good to go. Yeah. Okay, thank you. As you can see, I, I, I'm not the best in the world on uh, the the Zoom sharing screen elements, but I'll, I'll take you through the the safety task force, uh, how it came to be, and what we're we're trying to achieve. So first of all, uh, there's a nice picture of an axle counter head. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what an axle counter head looks like. So the, the safety task force, uh, the safety task force was put together in 2019, around October, uh, on the, uh, after we had two fatalities at Margam. And when we look back to 1997 and the fatalities in our industry, uh, we continue to kill people. Uh, and only uh, in February this year, unfortunately, we lost another uh, colleague, Tyler Byrne at Surbiton, who was struck by a train and killed. So the ORR have issued Network Rail with two uh, improvement notices. Uh, these improvement notices centre around our ability to plan our work and also the use of technology and the implementation of the technology. Uh, one of our key tests is that any ORR inspector can meet with an engineer or a manager for that section, and they should have a defined access strategy and be able to discuss that, demonstrate it, and to show how they were compliant with the 019 uh, hierarchy control of risks and how we've planned and accommodated uh, to compliance with that. So that's our key test. So what are our key targets? We're going to eliminate unassisted lookout working. Uh, since July 2019, we've reduced uh, nationally by 75% of the unassisted lookout working that we do. Uh, I come from the Sussex route. In Sussex, we started off uh, over 50%. So over half of our maintenance work was delivered with lookout protection. And uh, it's, it's the lowest form of protection that's that's in the hierarchy. Uh, we are now, I'm proud to say, uh, 2% and under, uh, but we're aiming for zero by July. So what do we do with all these people? We put them into line blocks or possessions. Now, when we put people into line blocks, we've also declared that we will provide 100% additional protection in these line blocks, uh, which brings us on to what we're going to do, uh, talk about later. So if you, if you keep that in mind, that we've said that we're going to increase line blocks and we're going to have 100% additional protection in these. And again, we, we've said we'll do 100% compliance with the 019 standard. That's what I discussed earlier about the hierarchy of controls. Possession being the safest, safeguarded possession being the safest way we can deliver our work and unassisted lookout working being the lowest. Uh, we will, as an industry, uh, eliminate unassisted lookout working, uh, or at least that's the plan. So the safety task force is looking at the planning. So we're having work bank reviews. Uh, in Sussex and Kent, we have over 300,000 maintenance scheduled tasks every year that we need to undertake as maintenance. So we're looking at every one of those and making sure that they're planned the, the safest way that it possibly can be. We're also looking at the signal or workload. Now, as we move more work into possessions and line blocks, then we are going to increase the workload on signalers. We need to understand what the, that safe threshold is. We don't want to just transfer the risk from the track worker into the signal box. We're looking at the line block uh, data that we have. Uh, as I said, we've got a target of 100% with additional protection. The planning for delivery takes a, a technical solution to what we're doing today. So it allows us to do the, the safe work pack, uh, putting them together on a central system, also, al also allows us to plan how we're going to deliver our line blocks uh, far easier 
and also be able to believe it or not, we can't get information on how we've uh, how we've created safe work packs at present. This new system will allow us to do it. Over the next two years, this will be rolled out nationally. It's currently at trial stage, and that's, uh, I think, around uh, the Manchester area. So the track safety technology, uh, what you're seeing on that little picture is a thing called the ZKL, which in Dutch means uh, track circuit operating device. Uh, for those in the industry, you'll know what a track circuit operating device does. In a track circuit, it is it allows you to be able to mimic a train, if you like, by dropping the track circuit. So that's our near miss frequency. We, we are still having it, where if you look at Southern, we're quite high, where we still have near misses. That's the opportunity uh, for us to kill people. And uh, this, is, this is why we're, we're making the change and why the change is, is probably the most radical change we've seen in the rail industry since we electrified, started electrifying the railway. So it's a huge once in a, a generation change that we're doing. Uh, we are looking to bring down near misses. We are looking to mitigate that. And all of the elements you'll see uh, eliminating unassisted lookout working, as well as providing that additional protection uh, within a, a line block is part of that. So where we have track circuits, we can deploy uh, the ZKL, as I said. The ZKL mimics the train, and there's over 700, uh, well, I think we're closer to 800 of these deployed at present. These are semi-portable. They're charged off of a solar panel. They have battery feed and battery trickle feed, and they mimic a train. Now, these are controlled by an app, uh, which means after training that the costs can actually stand uh, outside the railway boundary and take a, a line block from the signaler and activate uh, the, the ZKL. The great benefits are that the signaler then sees that panel go from clear to occupied in a signal box. This gives them assurance that he's applied the protection in the right place. It also gives the assurance for the costs in the work group that the signaler again has applied the protection in the right place. So it's a, it's a it's a double whammy protection if you like. So that that's the huge benefit that we get out of the, the ZKLs. Uh, the other technologies that we're looking at uh, are a TAUS, train operated warning systems, uh, Lewis, which is the early early warning line side system remote disconnection device, which will disconnect the signaling system, SATWAS, which is a semi-automatic train warning system, uh, the ZKLs we've spoke about, and EPR. Now, what EPR does is it allows the signaler to bar any trains from being able to go into that uh, route area. Now, this is what we're here to talk about because it allows the signaler. So the signaler applies signal protection and then the signaler applies EPR. Uh, it's just assurance that good communication has been had between the signaler and the course that they're in the right location for him to place that signal protection. What we have here is an axle counter head that denotes the different sections that the signaler can see. If we could create something similar to the, the ZKL, which drops the track circuit for an axle counter head, and in some way, something to be activated by the course at, at line side that would go from clear to occupied on a signaling panel to give the signaler assurance that he's placed the protection and DPR in the right place and that the work group are in the right place. So that, that's just a, a quick quick update on the Track Worker Safety Programme. Uh, my name's Ray Clark. I'm the, the lead for Sussex. If you need to know anything more about the programme, uh, you can drop me a line at ray.clark at networkrail.co.uk and it's Clark with an E. Thank you very much. And I'll hand you back to Stuart. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so so yeah, thanks, Ray. So hopefully that um, will have 
reinforce to you the, the importance of safety to network rail and, and this project and this um, pin request in particular. Um, so I am now going to hand it over to um, Andrew Chandler, also from Network Rail, who is going to um, give a quick recap on the details of the, the challenge statement as published. Um, and then after that, we will go into the, the Q&A session. So um, Andy, if you're ready to go through the slides. Thank you, Stuart. So by now you should have found the challenge statement document. Um, and there it is. It's available from the practice page for download uh, together with the response template. The challenge statement itself is a four page document which explains the purpose of an actual account, which Ray uh, briefly discussed earlier on, what they look like, where on trucks they are fitted, and what the ambition is for the track worker safety innovation. On the screen at the moment is a quick recap. Axle counters are used to detect the passing of rail axles into a section of track. Once the axle is detected as passing into that section, the signaling sets the section as occupied. There's another axle counter at the other end of the section. And once all the axles which entered the section have exited the section, uh, that section can then be set to clear again. So it counts the axles in and it counts the axles out. A couple of examples, Ray showed uh, one earlier on. Uh, there is a number of different manufacturers, but they all do the same job and pretty much all the same dimensions. Um, they're made of two counting heads, though the design may not always be uh, make up of two individual counter heads. That's clear in the images shown here. Using the sleepers as a reference will hopefully give you an indication of the scale of these devices. They're typically designed to detect wheels of 350 millimetres or more in diameter with the minimum distance between the centres of 700 millimetres travelling at speeds from zero kilometres an hour to up to 300 kilometres per hour. In simplistic terms, the principal mode of operation for these actual counters is through the detection of electromagnetic field between a transmit coil and a receive coil. The presence of a metallic rail wheel passing through this field disrupts the strength of the field at the receive coil, which is used to infer the passing of a wheel. All of this information is in the challenge statement document itself and is publicly available information. So hopefully it will not be a great surprise to anyone today. So to paraphrase the challenge statement, the innovation which is hoped for will be some sort of device or solution which a track worker could use or deploy themselves, which would set an actual counter controlled section of track on which they're working to occupied. In concept, at least, this would be similar to track workers ability to deploy a track circuit operating device in track sections controlled by track circuits. Why is this innovation sought? To provide an additional layer of safety after an engineering possession reminder, EPR is set uh, to improve the mental well-being of track workers, knowing that they themselves have put in place an additional safety layer. The requirements for this innovation are listed in the challenge statement and are internationally intentionally sorry high level so as to describe the problem that needs to be addressed and some essential high level criteria but not so detailed as to preclude any innovative thinking on how to address the challenge the fundamental requirements are to provide the track to provide the ability for track workers to control additional protection at track level thereby provide an additional reassurance to track workers in addition to epr the control, the additional protection for increased safety of track workers should not be removable accidentally or unintentionally. The control, the additional protection for increased safety of track workers should be standalone and not require any external power source. And any equipment to be the size and weight which is easily portable and operated by one person uh, target weight below five kilograms. Okay, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, so that was say, a very quick recap of the challenge statement, which hopefully you'll all be familiar with. 
already. <coughs> um, and coming back to the original objective of this, is, of this session, it is to enable you to clarify your understanding of the challenge to be solved so that you can submit your best response to the prior information notice. <coughs> so hopefully we've um, done that. <coughs> um, coming up to the agenda, so we've done a <coughs> introduction uh, to both ourselves and the safety task force. We've had a recap um, of the challenge statement document itself. Um, so we're now into the question and answer session, which, as I said at the start, is the I suppose the main aim and main focus of the session is to, to be an interactive two-way session. So you can ask any questions you would like to ask, whether it be about what the solution needs to do, what it needs to look like, what it, you know, what um, characteristics it needs to display, um, or it could be questions around um, the process for actually um, submitting a response as well. We have obviously the, the experts of Network Rail on the call. We also have myself and we have um, colleagues from the Connected Places Catapult in procurement, for example. So if you have any questions on the process, we can answer those as well. <coughs> so as I said at the start, so hopefully I can, I can see some questions that have already started to go into the Q&A panel. Um, so as and, as and when more questions come to your mind, please put them in there. Um, and the way we will run this session is um, <coughs> that we will open the mic. So we'll run through the list of questions in the panel one by one. Um, and we will open the microphone for whoever has asked that question and invite them to um, essentially ask the question in their own words. And then we'll um, let to whichever that is the most relevant person within the panel to, to answer that question for you. So if we go to the look at the Q&A panel. So the first question is from Mary Fannon. So if we're able to, Nick, if we're able to open the microphone. And the question, well, Mary, do you, are you able to? Um, do you wish to want to answer, ask the question in your own words and then we'll, we'll answer it as best we can? Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm from Inform Communications and you'll notice from my second question that uh, we provide loan worker safety monitoring and alert services. And uh, when we first read the information, uh, we could see that it had something to do with equipment for the tracks. And, uh, you know, obviously we're not experts in this area, but you've confirmed that to me today in your presentation. So you're clearly looking for some equipment that the, the person, uh, the track worker can apply uh, independently to the track that would, as you say, um, make sure that trains don't uh, come into the area. So they, they are alerted that they must stop early. Um, and uh, consequently, it looks to me like um, our initial response, which was really just to, to inquire about it, uh, would suggest that uh, we're not the company uh, who can do that for you, because that's not our uh, line of expertise. We don't manufacture uh, uh, any, any equipment as it happens. Uh, we uh, develop software and uh, it's bespoke and it answers to the requirements of our clients. So that's why I asked the second question, because once I'd realized from your presentation that actually it definitely has nothing to do with the area of our expertise, um, then, you know, the question here is it's an opportunity for me to just ask, uh, although if, if, the, if, the, if it was the case, it would have been part of the um, information that you provided. So just simply, um, it's a yes or no, uh, is loan worker safety solutions um, part of any aspect of your needs? So for this specific challenge, you're right that it's not within the context of this, but I'm sure if, if either Ray or we also have Mark Prescott for Network Rail or Andy, want to come on and comment. I think loan worker safety is definitely a, a high priority, I would imagine. 
I think it's, uh, I mean, first of all, thanks, Mary, uh, for taking the time to come in. And I think it's, uh, it is something that is being considered, but it's probably not right for what we're, what we're seeking today. But, but loan, working, uh, loan worker safety is definitely something that uh, is on the agenda. And if, if you want to keep in touch, then I can probably direct you to more of the operational side where we have loan workers typically responding to incidences uh, and uh, uh, any faults that they go to. So right. it may be that that's the, the, the better uh, audience for you, if you like. Yes, it is. That's absolutely right. Um, I do appreciate uh, your response. And um, if you are able to point me in the direction of a particular person, perhaps through yourself, maybe, should I be communicating with you? I think if you, if you give me, if you email me your details, then I'll make sure that they're passed on to the, the relevant people who would be looking at this sort of thing. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned your email address earlier, ray.clark with an E at uh -huh. Network Rail, is it? Yes, yes. Dot com? Dot co dot uk. Dot co dot uk. Network rail dot co dot uk. That's brilliant. So I'll definitely do that. Send through uh, some information about us uh, and we'll look forward to, um, you know, continuing that conversation uh, with the relevant uh, teams uh, within Network Rail. Thank you so much for your patience. So Thank you, I'm, going, I'm going to leave the session if that's all right in that case. I'm just I'll move to one comment before you do that. What I was going to say was, although, although um, sort of not necessarily the solutions we presented, but particularly talking about the, um, the track sake operating device, it gives the context of being a physical solution which can be deployed. The, the intention of the requirements was not to preclude any potential innovation. So it might be that there is some sort of more software oriented solution which can, you know, trigger the, the control panel, for example, of the yeah, access counter, but I don't think, I don't, yeah, essentially we don't want to rule out any potential solution at this stage. Is that fair, Ray? I can, I can build on that. What, uh, what we're talking about is potentially we can have software solutions that interface with our signal, or, uh, signal system, uh, which if activated by a cost would mimic a train going to that section. So there are, there are, it, it'd be, a bit of a deep dive into our signaling systems where we've got the actual counters deployed and finding out what technology could be interfaced with that to give control away because at present it's controlled by a signal box miles and miles away. Uh, how is that, that data transmitted between the signal box and the actual equipment that controls the signal and equipment? So it may be that, that there's something that we can do software-wise uh, that we can activate from an app on a phone because ultimately that's where we'd want to get to. We'd want to, to have it so that the guys would, wouldn't have to go on track to apply uh, the additional protection. We understand that in this occasion, we're not saying that that's the solution. We're, we're, we're not saying it's not. We're just saying we have a problem. Can you help? Uh, so I, I wouldn't rule out anything, as, as Stuart said, at present. Uh, it's definitely worth digging into a little bit and seeing whether our signaling systems uh, can be made to interface with an app or something. That's it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> That's very interesting. I'll definitely pass that on to our IT development team and, and see what response they give to that. Um, it's very much a, an interesting idea, I should say. Uh, so, yeah, that, that sounds great. So we'll we'll go away with that and, uh, you know, uh, feed back to you, Ray, if that's okay. Uh, the uh, reaction I get when I put that proposal forward. Um, and uh, meanwhile, separately from that, uh, I'll also send you information about the loan worker solution that we provide, if, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. It was uh, very instructive. So it's much clearer uh, to us now what your needs are and if there is any opportunity that we can help with uh, in terms of the software side of things, then uh, that would be great too. But we'll look into that 
and and let you know what uh, what IT development at Inform uh, say they can come up with if 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 it applies. Thank you very much. So thank you indeed. Um, I will therefore, uh, unless you think I should stay on the session, I I might therefore leave and and uh, pass on the information to my colleagues. That's fine. I mean the whole the whole session before us. It can always come back to rest later if you wish. Is that lost Mary there? Um, but yeah, just I think everyone is aware of this. But yeah, the, the session is recorded. So if you wish to see any parts of that later, the, the link will be sent out, I think, after the event. Okay, on to the next question. The next question is from Stephen Mills. So the question, if we can open his microphone, the question was around funding and how much funding is available for this challenge. Stephen, are you able to open your microphone? That's it. Thank you very much for that, Stuart. Yeah, um, Steve Mills, University of Birmingham, Senior Industrial Fellow. Um, I've, I've raised three questions, but we'll, we'll go with the first one first. And that is, um, I just want to understand how much funding is being made available for this challenge. And um, do you envisage a suite of projects, more than one project, to be funded um, to um, find the ideal solution or solutions for network rail? Maybe just to answer the first part of the question. So I suppose for this current pin, at this stage, it's a request for information to sort of understand what capabilities and technologies are out sorry, there. Sorry, you're not very loud. No, sorry. So um, the, the purpose of the pin as it currently is, is to understand what technology and capability and innovations are available or potentially available in the market. Um, and the network rail colleagues may wish to comment, but based on what technology is found, um, I believe fun, my understanding is that funding would then be sought as needed if there's technology that appears promising. Is that correct, Ray? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think if we, uh, good morning, Stephen. I think if we got uh, proposals that were, were really exciting, that could be used and, and adapted uh, in different environments throughout our industry, it would be something that we would be keen to explore. Uh, at present, we, we, have, uh, we have developed a number of different uh, technologies that we're looking at. Uh, some of them are, are proving more difficult uh, to implement than we, we first anticipated. But if, if, if someone was to come up with a, a potential solution to this issue, and uh, it was a technological solution that, that uh, could be adapted into other elements uh, to provide a safer working environment for our workforce, then it, it, it'd be foolish of us not to try and explore that as far as it possibly could. And with regards to the level of funding would be uh, directly related to uh, the benefits that we as an industry, uh, not just the company, but as an industry could see that uh, giving us. So it's, it's, it's not, unfortunately, it's not going to be a, just a, this is how much money is available and work with that. It's, if, you, if you give us ideas of what you can and what you can't do and, and come up with things that are new, innovative, that we can work with you and explore. And if they can interface with our, our signaling systems uh, or, or other things, then that's something we would be keen to explore as a, a not only an organisation, but an industry. Okay, thank you very much for that. Right, I appreciate that. That makes sense. Well, on to your second question as well, Stephen, on the um, regarding the ZKL. Sorry. Should I go on to my second question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, while we have you on the. On the yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, uh, appreciate. Yeah. Um, just looking at the uh, presentation, Ray, that you gave, it was really um, interesting. And um, being an ex-RSSB employee and knowing how serious we take safety um, and the protection of our staff um, that do um, work on the railway. The ZKL um, system I, I've seen before, but I was just wondering about its application. Um, from the slide, I saw that it's applied on one line only, and there are adjacent lines, yeah? Are those adjacent lines protected at the same time, 
or are they left alive to allow trains to continue working through the zone? And then would we classify the zone that the, the track workers are operating in as a red zone? I can ask this if, if possible. So the, the ZKL is a remote control track circuit operating device. It activates the track circuit, protecting the line that the track workers are on. If they are working on adjacent lines, they will need additional ZKLs or T codes for those lines they are working on. Yeah, so if they're not working on those lines, then there's a risk from, um, you know, uh, trains passing by at causing uh, accidents. If well, they step, if they step, if they stray out of their uh, the work that the area that they're working in, yeah, 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 yeah that, that's outside the, the line blockage. Yeah. yeah, let me come in here, Andy. We, we we do have other technologies to support that as well as the the uh, <coughs> the site warden duty, Stephen. We're yeah. also looking at geotech fencing that yeah. is quickly deployed uh, and gives an automatic alarm. So where we have an adjacent line open. We can yeah. protect people, so it's not just a do not step over the outside rail of yeah. the in, in the forefoot. We can actually set up. Well, we're, we're trialing geofencing to give us an audible alarm uh, if anyone's trying, if anyone does stray yeah. towards an open line. So, yeah. although we can't block all the lines all the time, uh, mm -hmm. we can warn people if they are approaching an open line, and that's as technologies that we're we're trialing at present. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. So there, there, there are still additional risks. Um, so it's all about the philosophy of site protection for all the staff operating in that area. There's, um, this is why um, um, standard 019 is important on how you uh, control those additional risks. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did you say you had three questions or? Yeah, well, the last one I think has been answered by Raj, yeah. and that is, um, is the pin in a standard format and is a template available? So I now have that. There's a link. Okay, so, okay, so next question on the list was from Stuart Kent, um, and this was around providing feedback to our submission. So the question was around, I previously submitted a submission but got no feedback. Um, so if we're able to open Stuart's microphone. So... I guess because we've run a number of these PIN events or these PIN calls previously, we have recognised that people who respond would appreciate some feedback. So certainly in the more recent PIN calls we've done, we have tried to give everyone some level of feedback. Um, is there anything, Stuart, anything more you want to, to ask um, in relation to the feedback? No, no, no not really. Uh, despite them only being requests for information, um, it does help to, for SMEs to get that feedback. Um, so that would be appreciated. I also very much appreciate um, the discussion around the, um, the technology in regards to the software. Um, uh, Jeeves, a, a geospatial engineering company, we're applying um, our application to Rail for London infrastructure, which is taken over from Crossrail. Once they get the ROGS and the OR, goes acceptance as the Elizabeth line. So the ability to visualize data, um, you discussed the MSTs earlier on, Ray, um, some time ago, uh, I was on the railway uh, in part going into ellipse and so on. So the ability to visualize um, data, visualize assets, create communication is something that Jeeves trying to do for rail for London infrastructure. It's fair to say I've never really previously thought about how you can create a digital twin type scenario where you could interlock into signaling systems uh, and create communication channels that way. But I think um, initially when I, I was talking about these axle counters and it's fair to say I'm an overhead line engineer gent so I don't really look at the track very much other than when I drill holes in it but now that um, I am uh, aware that you're happy to, to look into that digital side of things um, it, it was uh, very much appreciated listening to that discussions and Mar Mar Mary before us um, uh, has given me the insight to, to actually respond to this uh, and even if we're not successful from an SME's perspective um, it, it's always appreciative to, to to get response good bad or indifferent it helps me for my next submission so it would be appreciated anyway. Okay. Yeah we like to say we would have recognised in the past of we should have done that towards you. You're not too late so I'm happy to get feedback <laughs> from my last submission so let, let's what, go back. Was that last one the, we we chaired or held it was, was it? Yeah, it was. Uh, now the reality is, I have been on 
uh, network rail for some years, 28 years. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm looking my age. Um, so it was actually for John Nolan's uh, BIM strategy for Great Western. Mm-hmm. So the ability to create digital twins and so on. But again, I think if we're looking at rather than just the hardware uh, and we could see there was five examples of the hardware and how we've attempted to create safer environments on the railway. I think hardware aligned to um, technology, as long as it, it doesn't confuse people, it is probably it accumulates to a safer railway environment. So again, I, I'm not in the hardware business um but regrettably i've had a few near misses myself and i think clear information um taking the confusion away from ellipse msts work arising really visualizing where people are working not necessarily at the time but before helping briefs and so on i I think it's key to it all accumulates so i'm going to respond to this and, and i may um i i don't know some of you gents ray i'm i don't think i've ever worked with you in the past um but I think I'll send some of the team examples of what we're doing for Ralph for London infrastructure in regards to visualising data and how an awful lot of good things could be achieved in the mess room, um, never mind by the time they get on track. Okay. Uh, yeah, if, they have, if, that, if they have mess rooms anymore, to be fair, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've been into the depots. I imagine they do. That's perfect. I mean, that, that's all, as I said at the start, the whole reason we do these kind of pins in quite an open requirements style to, to, to invite you know in solutions that we might not have thought of already so yeah it's good to hear yes. that you're planning to submit something excellent thank, thank you, you very much um, the next question was from an anonymous attendee so please can slides from the presentation be shared with attendees so the, the rec- so this session is all being recorded so that will be available afterwards um, and I don't see a problem why we can't send the slides out. I think we're planning to send the slides out well afterwards uh, so the next question is from Tibbet. i hope i pronounced that correctly um so if we can open the microphone so the question was what's preventing workers from using calibration devices to swipe in on a section yep um don't know if you can hear me yeah you can yes. right it's uh, it's tebow just for, for future reference um yeah, so so as far as I understand, you you already use the calibration device, which is you know small enough and, and sort of fits your your requirements to see if the thing works, the, the 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 axle counter works. And my question is, what would be, if anything, what would be preventing you from using something like this or this exact device to sort of swipe in one axle on a segment? Would that work? Why wouldn't it potentially work? And I imagine I don't know exactly how it works, but can you? Well, I guess I guess the tracks only go in one in one direction, don't they? So if you swipe in, then you can't swipe out at the same lo- location. So would that mean then a worker would have to walk to the end of a segment, sort of to to swipe out again? If that makes sense, just a physical side. I appreciate that we're also looking at digital solutions, but that's my first question. Don't know if it's clear. Yeah, that's a question to the, to the network rail. Ray, maybe or Mark. Yeah, it's just came up that Track Worker Safety Innovation and Awareness webinar would like to answer this question. Uh, is there anyone on that has that moniker? If not, I will I will try and answer that uh, table. Uh, you're right, we do uh, use uh, dummy wheels to check whether axle counters are working. Uh, we can reset from in the signal box when an axle counter is activated. Uh, but it requires us to remove the EPR to be able to do that. Uh, so what we're now the, the reason this this whole thing developed was uh, in December 2019. I was sitting with two signalling engineers uh, when they challenged me and said, "Well, the ZKLs are phenom- fantastic for the track circuited areas. What are you going to do for the the axle counter areas?" And I said, "Can't you just use a, a a dummy wheel and they said well not really uh, and we don't want everyone running around with a dummy wheel can't we develop something like an ACOD that may do the same sort of thing but the remain in situ uh, can't we find a technical solution that will mimic that so that's why we're here because the track signaling engineers don't think that the dummy wheel is the solution either uh, that we need something slightly different to that 
or indeed let's open it up and see if we can get a huge change of innovation as something we've not considered uh, to, to actually provide that same level of assurance to the cost and the, the work group uh, that they've actually got a, an element of control when they're working in a line block. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. That, that clarifies it. Um, I, I imagine indeed that this innovation sort of is thinking outside the box. I just want to check why, why are you not using sort of the obvious, obvious solution? Uh, right. Is it, is it okay if I carry on with my second question, because I feel like it's linked and you've already partially answered it is how do you currently correct for errors in the system? So if you get a false positive, uh, can a signalman remotely override an axle counter or does that have to happen on site? And you know, if if you have if you use the axle counter with the dummy wheel or something else, or if you set it remotely, how would you differentiate a worker from a train? So the signalers have the ability to conditionally reset and unconditionally reset the EPRs um, after thing pre conversion. They would remove the EPRs if any are um, not clearing. So we have a sweeper train, a sweeper train would be the first train through in the morning, and that would have to go uh, caution and follow instructions. There is processes. It's not a, I'll just press that button, it will move the EPR or it will reset the axle counter. It is a process, and it's designed as such that it can't be done by accident. Does that help? Yep, thank you. I've got more questions, but I'm happy to... Uh, pass on to, to someone else so I don't take take yeah, up too much time. Pass on because we've got quite a few questions then. Yeah, we can come back to you later on. Um, so the next question was from an anonymous attendee. So does the solution have to include hardware? Can this be remotely controlled via the use of secure APIs? So I think we've hopefully answered that question that it doesn't have to be a hardware solution. We can explore software solutions as well. Um, Anything Ray, Mark, or Andy want to add to that? No? Okay, next question was from Eduardo Mendoza. Um, so if you can open his microphone, please. So uh, questions around what's the preferred method of communication from the device to the signaler control system? Is it GSM, radio link, GPRs, etc.? Yeah, hello there. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. It was just, uh, I think I already answered um, my question uh, earlier. It's about uh, uh, simulate uh, similar to the Z uh, ZKL and the methods of communication to the uh, signal room from the device. But uh, I guess if you are simulating something, it will automatically activate the signal, as in red zone. Um, so the question I had, uh, which is I don't think it's applicable now, is what sort of communication I was thinking, GPRS or GSMR, etc., um, uh, from a different method of physical simulator. Do you have any particular uh, preference with regards to communication to the uh, signal signal room? I guess from, from my point of view, uh, having worked on track, I'd want something that couldn't be interfered with with other systems uh, that would give me that uh, connectivity regardless of where I was in the route, whether I was in a cotton, whether I was in an area with typically poor reception for mobile phones. So it's something we can live with and we can work with. But if you're asking me for my ideal uh, communication system, it, it would, I can tell you what it would look like because it, it would be 100% reliable and it wouldn't interfere with any existing systems that are already deployed in the railway. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, move on to the next question is from Steve Sass. And the question, so if you can open Steve's microphone. So, um, Question is whether anyone has made contact with European Track Worker Safety Group. Um, so, Steve, do you want to ask yeah, the guys, question in your own words? Yes. Um, guys, Mark, I, and Mark, I can see you on the call, but guys, we could be looking for a solution here that already exists. And I'm just conscious that during my time at Neverwell, and I know in previous years, you've been part of a European um, Track Worker Safety Group. And I'm just conscious that whilst we've got 
manufacturers like uh, Dual Inventive and Zolner and Schweitzer, they, they will only present their products to you. And I'm just thinking, is it worth touching bases if we're no longer members of the European Work, Track Worker Safety Group? Is it worth making contact with them to see if there are any other solutions? Because, you know, it, the guys that are providing solutions at the moment will only veer you to their products. And I'm just thinking, oh, do Deutsche Bahn have something else? Do the French have something else? Do the Swedes have something else? Um, so we could be missing a trick if we're not if we're not part of that European Track Worker Safety Group and looking at technology and innovation, or if we're not part of it, you know, could we such bases with them? Yes, Steve, uh, a very valid point. Uh, we, we, well, as you're aware, we, we thought of this uh, and brought it to the centre. Uh, we're assuming that if we are still involved with the European Track Worker Safety Group, uh, that we are having regular catch-ups with them. Uh, but I will take it on board and I will make sure, make inquiries. Uh, obviously, we, we, we would love to have had the interface at the start of the programme, but due to COVID, we've been kind of restricted on what we can and what we can't do. So if, if you have any contacts, you have my email address. Greatly appreciate you sending across any contacts that you had. And, yeah, and I'll yeah. see if they're still in existence. I mean, I noticed Mark's on the call, Mark Prescott, and I don't know who who the last network rail rep was, or who it currently is. If we still have, if we still have a place, Steve, if can you hear me? If yeah. it was, if it was, um, I was probably the last person, um, and I am still a member of the what was the uh, working group thirty five? I think it was under the UIC for track worker safety. Um, but there hasn't been any meetings okay. for a number of years since the uh, the standard for track warning systems was published um, a couple of years ago that is now a British standard. So uh, I'm not aware of, I mean, I can still uh, touch base with those people. Um, but the problem we have, of course, is if we, our commercial rules are that if even if we go and find a product, it doesn't necessarily mean we can go and buy that off the shelf because we have to go through the, no, the tendering that. processes and that. So that's where it gets sticky. But I'm not sure that group actually still exists. If you know otherwise, then absolutely let us know. We'll go and touch base with them and find out. But I haven't heard anything from them for a long time. But Mark, even if it doesn't exist anymore, there they would be still people that we could make contact with in, yeah. the, relevant, in, yeah. in the relevant railways. But I'm just conscious that, you know, the current manufacturers of these products will only bring their products to the table. Well, you know, and there could be other products that we don't know about. Say again, Mark. I said, I think that's why Ray's done this exercise to, to, yeah, to yeah. get a wider audience and, yeah. and, and more interest. Look, I'll put my feelers out, guys. So I've still got a few contacts in, in places like Deutsche Bahn and the Dutch Railways and French as well. So... Um, but I think it's worth us exploring just to see if there, if there is anything else out there that we don't know of. I'd be yeah. surprised if we, don't, if we don't know, but you never but you know. You thought the actual counter manufacturers would know if there was. Yeah, you would know, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Well, here we go. Okay, thank you, guys. Okay, cheers, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so the next question is actually a couple of questions. I think we've probably covered them both together from Nick Rees. So if we can open his microphone. So the first question was around, um, is the feeling that it's a hardware-based solution and not exclusively a software solution, and then a related question later on um, around how it's, is it possible to gain more information around the signalling system? So, Nick, do you want to, um, is there anything you want to expand on in your question? Nick Rees appears to have left, sure. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll answer his question offline then. Uh, so next question was from Zoe E. So the question was, what percentage of network has axle counters? Um, are axle counters and track circuits mutually exclusive? So once you have a solution for each, you'll cover the whole network. Mm -hmm. open, if Zoe's still online, can open a microphone. Anything you want to expand on your question, Zoe? Hello. Um, no, not really. It, I guess the principle of my question is, are you looking for a single solution for the whole of network rail? Is this a regional approach where you're looking for um, a kind of local trial that, that you would 
a bit like the University of Birmingham guy said earlier, you would potentially try different things in different regions. So with, with regards to actual cameras and track circuits, actual cameras tend to be the train detection of choice for resequence things. It's they're more and more common than they used to be. So if a line gets resignaled, it tends to get an actual counter replacing the track circuits that were there originally. I don't have um, an idea what the percentage is of actual counters across the country. Um, and it would, if we had a solution for track circuits and actual counters, it would cover a vast, uh, a great percentage of the train detection across the country. Okay. Okay. Answer your question, Larry. Yes, um, and there's a second question on there. Do you want me to ask it at the same time? Yes, yeah, no, no idea. Um, it was so that covers the sort of train detection side, and then the signalling side. Would you, assuming you were talking about some kind of communication system, um, potentially mobile systems? Although obviously uh, Ray raised the point about mobile signal coverage earlier, etc. Could you send? what would effectively be a kind of signaling information through that kind of communication channel? So my, under, my basic understanding, and I, I'm not technically minded, I, I, I'm a former operator in a signal box that had track circuits okay. and actual counters. Um, my understanding is that the device would interfere with the interlocking, which would make the track show occupied. So therefore, it doesn't necessarily need to, in my understanding, and I'm not technically minded, so I'm not telling you which direction to go down. My understanding is the device would interfere with the interlocking and show that there is a train or an object or that that tracks, that actual counter section is occupied by a train or by this device. Right. So in my understanding of it, it wouldn't necessarily need a separate uh, transmit and receive function because of the induction loops as we went through on the, the slides. Okay. Thank you. But I'm not technically minded if the, the, <laughs> the, the, the minds come up with an idea that this is the best, you know, that, that that's obviously down to their expertise. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. Uh, okay, a couple, of, a couple more questions from Thibaut again. So if you want to open his microphone back up. So he had a couple of questions, one around um, how many redundancies are in place uh, and also what kind of ex hardware is expected yep. to, be, to be available to both train and crew maintenance crew. Yeah, so I, I guess uh, the, um, the first one has already been answered in, in part, but I'm, I'm, I'm still curious um, because you, you mentioned, you know, some, some of the stuff is more policy rather than systems, but basically this new system that we are talking about or new solution that we're talking about, how many other solutions, systems, processes are in place to guarantee the safety of the actual workers? So how, how essential, how crucial will this system be? So for actual counter areas, um, engineer's possession reminder is actually set by the signaler, as we discussed in the slides, as Ray mentioned, even though it's called engineer's possession reminder, it is controlled by the signaler. There is questions around the concerns from track workers that they should be able to apply additional protection. EPR, as far as I'm aware, is the only form of additional protection that the person who is applying the primary protection is is doing both. Okay, yeah, that, that, that first one was clear to me. I was I was wondering whether there was anything else. All right, fine. And then um, the question is, what kind of hardware? So, in terms of mobile devices, etc., is expected to be av available to the maintenance crew? And and my question I also put train crew, but from from the the answers that you gave previously, maybe that's irrelevant. Um, but yeah, so basic, basically what kind of hardware do they already have? What do we have to work with? Uh, at the moment, um, none for actual counters because track circuit operating clips don't work on actual counters. 
Now, what I mean is also in terms of mobile device, you know, if we're talking about a, a solution, you know, an app with, that does geofencing or something, do the maintenance crew have personal devices or do they have company issued devices? What, what kind of hardware from that perspective? They have iPhones and iPads um, and they use those for, say, the ZKL app. Um, they do use it for other in, in-house uh, apps and audit systems and, and reporting systems, things like that. Um, and, and after, or were you meaning something else? No, that, that was what I was meaning. Um, and, and in the diagram... Hey, Sorry, can I interrupt yeah. there? Um, yeah, sure. So network rail staff have uh, iOS devices, um, but you should look at it being the solution. If you have a solution that requires that sort of medium using a smartphone or something, it should be system agnostic because some of our contractors who will also want to use it may not use iOS. They could be using uh, the alternatives. So you should try... Uh, and the cater for all of the approaches. Okay. Does that help? Yep, yep, absolutely. And then the the last part of that, you know, if 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 you guys are pushing for out of the box anyway, the, I I think there was a, a little diagram in the documentation provided, which had a link or or a line directly from the uh, maintenance crew to the train, and so you know, is from working with talks, I I know that there is quite va wide variety in terms of what kind of hardware they have on board and, and devices and communication devices on board. Um, is this also potentially something that you're envisaging is some kind of direct communication between the maintenance crew and a train on the track? Um, can, can I answer this one? That line, so that line actually is uh, the, the physical uh, device that they will apply in the track. Uh, but um, the, the, the connection to train can potentially be also uh, actually researched. So that line is, uh, one line is EPR to signaler and the other line was to the track itself. Tiba, the issue is anything that requires trained fitment is normally uh, unnecessarily expensive, to say the least. Um, and there are such a wide range of rolling stock uh, and because rolling stock moves across the country as well, um, it's not necessary if you have to think outside of the normal passenger train stock as well, but include engineering trains as well and freight trains, etc. cetera. Um, you need quite a wide fitment of equipment if you're doing that. But uh, having said that, I shouldn't exclude it as an option, but bear in mind the likelihood of getting it, it would have to be really simple to fit and very cheap to do so uh, to make it a viable solution. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the challenges there, but I thought I'd, I'd raise it anyway. Thanks, that, yeah, that clarifies no, I mean, it. I guess Thanks. Network Rail doesn't operate like a metro system where it's a closed loop, if you like, and there's only a limited number of trains where everything moves around everywhere. That's the problem. And that uh, causes train footment to be unbelievably expensive. Yep. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm just... Next question is from Hans. I'm going to just jump ahead because you've got a few questions. I'm just going to jump ahead quickly and answer one of the, the individual questions. So Helen um, Helen Callaway has asked, can you provide more information uh, on what will happen following the submission of ideas on the 21st of April? So we can open her microphone. So um, once once the, all the responses are submitted on the 21st of April, we will essentially go through with Network Rail the, the technologies that have been well, the ideas and the solutions have been proposed um, and then sort of work together with Network Rail to, to identify those solutions which we think are worth further investigation. And then as I think Ray alluded to earlier, um, there's, I suppose, um, no, no definite, well, Ray, maybe you can come in and clarify your mind slightly, but no definite budget in, in terms of, you know, that there is a set amount of money set aside to do this project, but the understanding is to identify what technology is out there um, and identify where funding needs to be sought to, to investigate further those technologies or to develop. <clears throat> yeah, whether yeah, it's well, or... Sorry, Stuart. Uh, just like any business, we, we would look at the potential benefits that we could get uh, and how much it would cost to develop that. And that, that would be a decision that we'd take once we'd weighed up uh, what the potential benefits are as an industry of developing it further. Uh, so that, that's, 
it's there's not a set budget, uh, but depending on uh, the technology or or whatever's proposed, uh, uh, it's opportunity to be adapted to do different things. Uh, obviously, the more more things that it was uh, compatible with, which would improve perhaps performance as well as track worker safety, etc. Uh, we'd explore all the options with you and uh, the funding would be there if, if, if we could demonstrate that there was a, an achievable uh, output which would benefit track worker safety as well as other elements of the industry as well. Yeah, I suppose the, the immediate action would be review all the responses, provide some sort of feedback on how, how promising those solutions look, and then it's the network rail to, to decide how they want to, to proceed. And do you have a timeline for that first phase? Um, so the pin closed on the 21st. We then get the responses back, I think, the next day usually, and then sort of within a couple of weeks we do the... Um, sort of reviewing and so sort of feeding back to network rail or discussing with network rail on the solutions um, and as I said we would are intending to provide some feedback to everyone who's responded so that feedback will probably be within yeah a few weeks after that the pin closes but then the next steps obviously as Ray's alluded to are are open as to what network rail would then how they would then proceed okay thank you very much um, so if we now go to so Anselm Adams, so it's a couple of questions from you. Um, so I think the first question is around contact details of Network Rail. So Ray's already provided his contact details. Um, the second question is around, well, if we can open Anselm's microphone. So you said you're working with a major international tech company to provide um, geolocation tracking for I sure and and Psalms left. Okay. Hasn't the geofencing uh, pin already been done anyway? He's missed the boat there, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll respond to him. I'll find that's no problem. Nick is the next. He has also left. So next is Klaus. Klaus Alion. So actually, Klaus, you've asked three or four, five questions, three questions. So yeah, the floor is. We can open this micro. The floor is yours to ask your questions. Hello, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the first question is uh, any solution where a track worker um, might activate the device over, over a mobile phone, iOS or, or Android, um, would you have reliable GSM or mobile data coverage throughout uh, the sections where, where you have these axle counters or would we need to look at uh, a more fail safe um, potential IoT network to, to operate such a solution? To answer that? Yeah, I'll um, So Klaus, I think, yes, there is GSMR, which is what our train drivers use, which is the railway version of GSM. Mm -hmm. um, and that's possibly a solution, um, although um, that has limited uh, bandwidth, as I understand. So um, being able to use that could be problematic or getting the right priority on the signaling on it. Um, the systems that you suggest will need a safety case and should be fail safe. Um, and, and I think that's probably answers the question, does it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, perfectly fine. Thank you. Um, can I can I follow on with the next question? Yes, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the next one, if if a track uh, worker, I, I assume, would not work um, uh, by themselves, there would be a working party. If the track worker then kind of resets uh, the track to being being open again, how would this this worker know that everyone else of the working party is in a safe place? That's current practice um, and within the safe system of work process and, the con and within the responsibilities of the controller of site safety. So oh. um, um, every, every work group has a controller of site safety who's exactly responsible for that scenario. 
if you have two or more groups, then each of those will have a control of site safety. And, and our current rule book allows for multiple causes to work within a line block, in which case you then need someone who's overarching called a protection controller. So there's a hierarchy established to stop people uh, being left in the lurch, as it were, with an, an, an unprotected. So that's already established. So enough. it's kind of a manual process you, yes, you have in place, but a safe manual process. Yeah. So, yeah, what you could do, um, and this would be something to think about, if you did have a solution, would be have a vir virtual padlock solution, whereas one group puts their own padlock on the ACOD, uh, virtually, as it were, and then another group puts their padlock on. So if the first group leaves, the, the, the padlock of the second group is still in place and it stops the, the ACOG being removed inadvertently. Yeah. That would be a good thing to do. Per group. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And and the last uh, question I've, I've got, um, at least I could think of at the moment, um, if I understand the technology correctly, and I'm not technical, um, the, the axle counter uh, has kind of like a route back to wherever the signaler sits so that the signaler would see uh, what the axle counter detects or, or doesn't detect. So there, there is a network in a, in a way in place. If, if we're looking at a solution, um, I'm assuming that you would want the same networking and monitoring to be used, i.e., not a separate uh, kind of, um, let's say, information going to the signaler uh, saying, uh, or to the, to the system saying that this, this section is blocked. That I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm explaining that. Uh, no, I think you've got enough. it. Right, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're looking for a solution that is an overlay solution that is specifically for the local team on site so it's so they have it doesn't need to have a specific interaction with the signaler. That process is already established. So it's, it's the local cause who needs to know that he put his piece of additional protection, his ACOD that he put is, is in place, is working correctly. It doesn't have yeah. to be communicated um, technically back to the signaler. Yeah, let, let me try and explain uh, what we've got with axle counter sections just now. Uh, so what happens is the cost will come along with his work group at present. He will ask that the track is blocked between point A and point B. The signaler will then, uh, after his instruction, he will block the track between point A and point B, and he will apply another additional layer called EPR. Now, there has been a miscommunication at that point between where point A and point B are, or, or he thought he heard point uh, A and point C, uh, then we have a signal or applying protection, which is not what the cost actually needs. Now, there's no way for the signal to know that the cost is anywhere other than where he's asked for that protection to be placed. And there's no way for the cost to know that the signal has actually placed the, uh, the block to signals where he's, where he's going to work. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get something that's activated locally by the cost for the area that he's going to work that will show up on the signaling panel mm -hmm. as something different. So that area is now something different because he's activated the axle counter at that area and the signaler would see that area of that section of track go from clear to occupied. That would be his confirmation that he's applied the correct uh, protection and he would relay that back to the cost that I have now seen my track go from clear to occupied in the section that I have blocked and provided signal protection for, for your works. So we are both clear that we are in the same area and you're working in the where I've provided the protection. That That's what we're looking for, because at present we don't have that. We have that for where the cost activates the ZKL and drops the track circuit. So it goes from clear to occupied in the signal box. So the signal sees that that's the area where the cost is and knows that he's provided that protection uh, in addition to that. Brilliant. That that clarifies it, Ray. That was my assumption. Yeah. So the signal would see that I've done something on the track to, to signify that, that I'm working here now. Yes. Yeah, lovely. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, so 
correct me if this is wrong, Ray, but essentially the, the handshake that is done at the moment between the cost and the signal is a sort of a verbal handshake. And what yeah, you're looking for is something physical that can be, that can't be, can't, yeah, it can't be mistaken, essentially. It's verbal and paperwork, but we have had instances where the verbal and paperwork uh, was misunderstood or, or uh, there was a typo, which meant that effectively we had people working in areas that didn't have signal protection. So that's what we're trying to eliminate, to give that, that if, if you like, dual assurance. So the assurance of the signaler that he has applied the protection for the works uh, in the right location because it's been shown to him on the screen uh, by something changing out on the track environment that the course is actually activated. And um, just to add to that, we'd like something that when the cost places the A cod or whatever the device is, that they get a positive confirmation that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Mm. Okay. So, thank, yeah, thank you for your question, Carson. Glad that clarified things for you. Um, the next question slash comment as much as a question really from Stephen saying I would recommend that human factor specialists are engaged in this challenge if you're not already doing so um, so we're not already doing so this is at this stage purely about understanding what um, technology or what potential solutions are out there um, but I would imagine that as and when you know a, a particular technology or technologies are selected to progress then human factors <coughs> would also be considered uh, Ray Mark Andy and if you want to add anything to that I think I think part of the the problem statement was we, we did tell you that for for an ergonomics point of view we want a, a certain weight that uh, as a maximum uh, we have uh, I, as you can understand this is the biggest change program network rails ever undertaken uh, as I said at the start since we electrified the railway so there are a number of uh, challenges that we have about embedding uh, the things that we're doing, about people's perception of risk uh, uh, and changing that. We, we did a survey at the start so as we could understand where we were and we'll, we'll, we'll undertake the same survey uh, at a later date and hopefully we'll have uh, altered the perception of risk and the appetite of, of, for risk from our frontline teams. It's not something that we're, we're not doing this in isolation. It's part of the, the safety task force and, and the whole programme of improving the safety of track workers. Uh, so obviously the human factors is a, a big part of what we're doing in this. Uh, but it's, it, we can't keep, there's not one item alone. It's all part of a, a bigger support programme. Does that answer your question, Stephen? I thought I thought it dropped out again. No. <laughs> and I was talking to myself. Uh, just in the interests of time, so we've got formally five minutes left, and we've got a couple of questions left to run through. So hopefully we can just squeeze through those in time. So the penultimate question is: When is it likely we would get any feedback from the responses? Um, so as I said, after the PM closes, it's let's say around a couple of weeks for us to sort of review all the responses and provide some feedback to Network Rail. I suppose that the the slight challenge in getting formal feedback to anyone who's um, submitted a response um, <clears throat> is that uh, until I suppose we have decisions within Network Rail as to whether a, a solution is something you want to proceed with or not, um, we have generally held back in providing the full full feedback until uh, until that decision has been made. Um, again, Ray, Mark, and did if you want to make any comments about how long you think it will take to make a decision that we can go back to suppliers with? If, if we got the, the right, uh, if, if we got lots of different solutions, obviously we need to evaluate them all, but if we got one that was standout, we need to do it right now. And remember that the every day that goes by where we don't have something different, uh, there is an element of risk that still remains there that we could eliminate by what we're asking uh, you good people to come up with uh, solutions for. So it's not something that we would we would sit on our hands with. Uh, we we try to make it happen uh, 
quickly but safely as well. So in a controlled way, but we, we try to roll it out. Obviously, we need to try it in a test environment to ensure that it does what it says on the tin. Uh, but feedback from the responses, we could probably, it depends on when the responses come in, but we could probably evaluate that within weeks uh, and come back to you. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these projects fall under what's termed the, the accelerated innovation team within Network Rail. So as Ray's alluded to, you know, th these are all problems that Network Rail are seeking solutions to, you know, quickly, essentially. So, okay, we've got one last question. So um, if we can hopefully get a very quick answer so I can wrap up and we can finish on time. So the last question is, can localised, this is from an anonymous, can localised solutions that are next to the track line but not on track line also possibly be envisioned, like radar sensors for train detection or track occupancy? Have I frozen? No, he's still there. Radar yeah. sensors for train detection already exist and there's a supplier already provides those. Uh, they're not currently product approved, I don't believe. Um, but there are a number of companies that have those solutions for train detection. Okay, excellent. Right, we've just had one one extra question to seek in, so I hope we can just squeeze this one in. So this is from Helen Callaway again. Uh, will we be able to view the textual responses to the questions in the chat following this webinar? Um, I'm not sure. I'll check with our events team if we're able to do that, but theoretically, no problem. Well, we can't do that. At the very least, the, um, the the full recording from this session will be made available afterwards, so you can at least hear the, the responses to questions in in the panel's words. Um, Nick C, I don't know if you're able to just quickly come in and uh, confirm. Sure. Yeah, we we could we could we could share the. Uh, questions and answers, um, absolutely. We just have to strip the information out, but yeah, we could, we could share the questions and answers. It's not a problem. Okay, well, we've gone through all the questions in the most recent time, so we've got two minutes left to wrap up. So, I'm back to my screen again. so yeah, like I say, we've, um, we've reached the end of the question sessions and we've also near enough reached the end of our hour and a half session time. So, I just want to Thank, well, obviously thank all the attendees for joining and showing interest in this um, this PIN response. It's, it's, I guess, very encouraging to see that there's a lot of um, innovative thinking and new ideas around providing a solution to this challenge. Um, and I guess we all look forward to, to seeing the responses in due course. Um, thank you also to the, the panel from Network Rail in particular for coming on and answering all the, the technical questions. It's, um, yeah, the session wouldn't be half what it was without having their input. So thank you for those. Um, just a reminder,